Okay, this could quite possibly be the most obvious black swan that has ever occurred before. Now, in all fairness, I don't think this is a COVID-style black swan event. That's a 3-4 standard deviation event that just doesn't happen all the time. I would consider this a two standard deviation black swan event. A one standard deviation black swan event could be considered something like a really bad jobs report or really bad piece of data. Something that doesn't happen all the time but is not that statistically unlikely to happen. A two standard deviation black swan event is something that happens maybe every 10 or 20 years. It, it doesn't happen all the time but when it does it's bad. The last time we had a port strike was in 2002. It lasted about 11 days and it took six months to recover from. Now during 2002, we were coming out of the dot-com recession as is. This time perhaps we could be entering into a recession. So this could be a tipping point, a critical inflection moment for the economy. It's being reported that you should expect shortages of bananas, booze, chocolate, and cherries, plus many other things, if there's a long port strike. This article from CNN says businesses have been nervously watching the 12.01 a.m. Tuesday strike deadline approaching with little sign of progress towards a deal to avoid a strike of tens of thousands of longshore workers. Many have been doing what they can to prepare for the shutdown, but there are limits. It doesn't make economic or logistical sense to ship many of the goods that come into East Coast ports by alternate ports of entry or by plane. Basically saying for a lot of companies, it may not make sense to spend the extra cost to go through perhaps the Suez Canal and go up a West Corp post or port and then transport the goods across the country via rail or via plane. Just economically speaking, it may not make sense to do that. And just so you guys know how little progress has been made in actually avoiding a strike, the, the, the union and the actual shipping companies have not talked about a labor deal since June. They haven't even been discussing this. They're playing a dangerous game of chicken with the U.S. economy. Now, I want you guys to take a listen to this clip where this individual just breaks down how this could affect our economy. And it's something you need to know. Now, with his outlook, the impact, what he sees ahead, National Retail Federation CEO Matt Shea. Matt. Good morning. Welcome. So how, how involved morning. are you in, in these negotiations from the retail side? Well, Sarah, we're not involved in the negotiations per se. Certainly, we've been communicating with the White House, the administration, since the beginning of this year, uh, trying to communicate that this is going to have a real impact on our economy. So as recently as this weekend, yesterday, I talked to Labor Secretary Julie Hsu. We regularly talked to the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House. We had a group of CEOs on a call earlier this morning and a number of them last week. And, and it's a concern not only because of the impact on the retail industry, but because we live in a global interconnected economy. And so whether it's retail or automotive or pharmaceuticals uh, or food and drinks, beverages, all those things are gonna be impacted at a time when we're finally turning the corner on inflation. We know that the job market and overall economic activity has moderated from the highs over the last several years. And this is really the last thing we need as a self-inflicted wound as we go into the fourth quarter of the year. So is, is your position now that the Biden administration should get involved? Well, what we've communicated from the beginning is we'd like to see the administration encourage the parties to continue the conversations. And formal discussions broke off back in June. So the parties haven't even had any formal discussions since then. That's of concern because if they aren't talking, obviously they're not making much progress. Uh, there's a political dimension to this, of course, and I'll leave that to the administration to share their perspectives. Our view is without regards to the positions of either side, either the unions or the, the shippers, the USMX, uh, we think they ought to be talking to each other and recognize that this has got a ripple effect way beyond retailers and our members have done everything they can to mitigate to guard against what might happen but no, no matter your scale i talked to the largest retailers in the world last week 
and this week and this morning, uh, no matter your scale, your sophistication, your resources, you can't prepare for every contingency. And so as well as they may be prepared, there are others who can't prepare at all. And that's going to have a ripple effect on families, on American workers across the economy that we just don't really need at this point in our economic cycle. Matt, maybe you can explain to viewers uh, how order cycles work regarding holiday and to what extent holiday might be disrupted if this lasts for a while. Sure. Well, Carl, y you and Sarah know this. You know these decisions are getting made months and months in advance. Mm -hmm. So some of these goods have been brought in earlier. Normal peak uh, container arrivals would be in August, September, October for the end of year season. This year we saw that pulled forward. So June, July, August, we saw lots of retailers anticipating there might be a slowdown or rerouting some cargo to the West Coast ports. I spoke to one of the executive directors of a major West Coast port yesterday as well. And they're running at 80% capacity. They've been taking goods into the West Coast and then retailers and others have been shipping across country, but the economics come into play as well. So at some point, even if you can get capacity on the West Coast, there's some goods for which it just doesn't make financial sense and economic sense to ship across the country by rail. And if they're not here by the fourth <coughs> quarter, they're not gonna get sold. And I guess the other point that's, that's worth remembering <coughs> is that, that, the, that the way a slowdown or a stoppage works, uh, it's not a linear, process. So if, if the ports are closed for one day or two days, they don't recover in one day or two days. This grows exponentially. It compounds every day. With a global supply chain, just because we closed down 40 ports on the East and Gulf Coast, the rest of the world keeps working. The ships keep coming, the factories keep producing, and clearing that backlog takes months. In 2002, right. the West Coast shut down 11 days. It took six months to recover from that. So uh, any day that goes by without continuing flow of goods, I think it's going to have a real consequence for the economy. Because I think it's pretty fair to say that as the stock market is near all-time highs, we're not pricing in any risk of this rail shutdown on the East Coast. And I mean, that's kind of crazy considering it starts tonight at midnight. It might just be something that slaps everyone in the face that, that just caught everyone off guards when tonight the strike starts. And I mean, I agree with this guy here that says the last thing our economy needs is this port strike right before the holiday shopping season. Now, this could potentially explain why you're seeing more Christmas things on shelves early this year. I mean, at the same time they were putting out Halloween things, they were putting out Christmas things. Basically everywhere where I live in Michigan, I'm, I'm sure it's basically the same where you guys live many weeks earlier. And that's because companies started bringing these things in months earlier. So they're putting them on the shelves earlier as well. Now, as I'm sure you guys are probably thinking, this could also have a impact on inflation. Now, the question will be, are people willing to pay the higher prices? If people are w willing to pay the higher prices, then there will be an inflationary um, boost via this port strike. If people are not willing to pay the higher prices, then there won't be an inflationary spike. It'll just be bad for companies. Because I want you guys to think about it like this. If you are a company that is making something that doesn't make sense to transport and spend, you know, 20, 30, 40% more on transportation costs to, you know, ship it across the country and go through the Suez Canal and, and do all that crazy stuff, then you're probably gonna slow down your production. Because think about it like this. If you, if you and your family, I, I wanna do something pretty relatable. If you and your family, let's say, go out to eat every Friday or get pizza every Friday, but, for whatever reason, this latest Friday, you didn't do that. Next Friday, are you gonna get double the amount of pizza? Are you gonna go out to two restaurants for dinner instead? No, if people are just unwilling to get products or if products are not moving and there's going to be a gap or lag between when products get produced and go on the shelves, people are just gonna go without. They're, they're not going to double buy things just because, okay? So that's why it, 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 these strikes, just being shut down for a day, can set things back three to five days or set things back you know, even longer than that. 
And that's why this could become very problematic because for an already weak labor market or a labor market that is slowing down, if companies' orders start slowing down, if companies are not able to produce as much, then that's going to put even more pressure on, again, an already weak labor market. And while some people are speculating the government is going to step in and tell the porters they cannot go on strike, what? that would be pretty un-American. That would be pretty unconstitutional, if you will, for, you know, the, the, um, the right to strike, the right to um, fight for what is fair. That's a possibility. Wouldn't surprise me. If the government did step in, something like Canada, where the rail, where you know rail workers try to strike and they and truckers try to strike, and Canada said, "Yep, nope, you can't do that, or you're going to jail," right? Wouldn't surprise me if something like that happened, but it would be very un-American for that to happen. So I don't think it's going to happen. Now Jerome Powell did throw cold water on this market in late trading today as well, and I will share some of the biggest headlines with you. Powell had some positive things to say like this. Disinflation is broad-based. Recent data indicates further progress towards sustained return to 2%. Jerome Powell says annual GDP revisions were quite interesting. He says that the labor market may give a better real-time picture of the state of the economy than GDP. He also says there's nothing suggesting a downturn is more likely now. Although many economic data points suggest that's not true, that there is evidence suggesting a downturn is more likely now. But this is what really pushed markets lower. Fed Jerome Powell says the Fed is not in a hurry to cut rates quickly. We'll be guided by data. He says if the economy is as expected, the SEP shows two more 25 basis point cuts in 2024, which earlier in the trading day today, the probabilities were more in line with 50% for 25 basis point cut, 50% chance of a 50 basis point cut coming November 7th. And now the odds are decisively changing again to 25 basis points. Now with the odds of 25 basis points at 68.5% versus 31.5% for 50 basis points. Markets in late trading today were forced to price in less accommodative Fed policy. Fed Jerome Powell also says the labor market is still solid, but it really has cooled. He kind of emphasized that a few times. And it's kind of a weird trade-off overall because the Fed saying that they're not really expecting to cut 50 basis points is like saying the economy is going to hold up better or the data is not going to come in as bad. But at the same time, the Fed opting for 25 basis points instead of 50 does kind of raise the odds of a recession because that means we're going to be restrictive for longer with Fed policy so it's kind of a weird trade-off between is this good news or is this bad news judging off of how markets responded today i think investors are taking this as bad news now tomorrow morning we will get some very important data with ism manufacturing pmis expecting these will actually get a little bit better from last month at 47.2 up to 47.5 now you will get um ism new orders ism prices um let's see employment and a couple other different smaller sub component data sets. i think employment's going to be the biggest area that investors are watching for because really all of the attention from markets as of lately is on employment markets so if manufacturing employment gets worse i don't think that's going to be seen as as good now the jolts job openings they're not really expected to move at all they're expected to stay at about 7.67 million if we do see job openings fall that's a sign of a weakening economy that's a sign of a weakening employment market and as more people are entering into the labor force as less jobs are available that will bring up the unemployment rate so job openings tomorrow morning will be very important now tesla stock today also had a pretty rough day along the same lines as the markets most of the decline for tesla stock really can be attributed to the negative guidance news out of Stellantis in which Stellantis got utterly destroyed today. Stellantis basically went from guiding for, uh, you know, free cash flow essentially to saying, hey, we could actually lose 5.6 to $11 billion from our certain, you know, segments of our business. Without getting into the specifics too much because I covered them in the last video, 
it was bad news today for the entire auto sector and although i think tesla kind of felt the slowdown first before stellantis and gm because tesla is direct to consumer i don't think stellantis's warning following volkswagen's warning should be interpreted as a warning for tesla i do think tesla is kind of in a different boat at this point compared to legacy oem i think tomorrow could be an interesting day i think the poor strike is going to catch a lot of wall street off guards um, even though it's something we've we've known is coming for a while now, I think it's going to become a lot more real <laughs> once it actually starts tomorrow. And then the data coming out as well. If Jolt's job openings do come in lower than expected, there's going to be even more fears about a weakening labor market. And tomorrow could set up to be a, a pretty rough day if both of those things do occur. But hey, these are just my thoughts, my opinions. I still think Tesla will have a good week. I think Wednesday is going to be a very strong delivery number for Tesla. And like I said in, you know, some of the prior videos, if you get a red Monday or red Tuesday, I think that is an opportunity to go long in Tesla. That's my personal opinion. That's my view. If you guys want to come trade with us live in real time, check out that link down below in the description of this video. Nonetheless, that's going to do it. You guys have a great rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one.